Welcome to another episode of Deep Dive, where we take a second look at a sermon that was preached recently at St. Albert Alliance Church. My name is Kirk, and I am your host. And on this episode, we're going to talk all about sex. We're going to talk about what's the big deal about sex. Why does God care about our sexuality? I've got Josh Ginn, our youth and young adults pastor, joining us. And he's going to interview me as I'm the one who gave this sermon on this subject. We're going to talk about uh, three people who encountered Jesus and the reaction Jesus had to them as they were people who had given up on holiness and sexuality. We're going to talk about the first steps to how we experience holiness in our sexuality. It's going to be a great conversation. I hope you'll stay with us. Hey, I'm here with uh, Josh Ginn, our youth and young adults pastor, and we're going to have a conversation about a, a sermon that I did recently on sex, and it was subtitled, What's the Big Deal? And you know what, Josh, I told my kids this title, and they were like, Dad, you got to change the title. I'm like, why? What's the big deal? But anyways, we're going to talk about <laughs> sex and sexuality, what God has to say about our sexuality, and if you haven't watched the sermon, I encourage you to go back and check it out. We'll have it in the links down below so you can watch that, but Josh, thanks for coming. I guess yeah. you're interviewing me today. Usually I interview people, but you're yeah. interviewing me. I'm, so. I'm glad to be interviewing. It, uh, it was a great message and just gave a good snapshot of, of sex, of sexuality, what scripture says about it. Um, I think you're framing around that you wanted to be a guide uh, to these passages and not the expert, not the guru, but to come and see what Jesus had to say about the, these things was significant. And I think we got a good snapshot and you wrapped up the sermon that was about well, 45 minutes long. Yep. And on like, the nose. Yeah, right right on. And that at, at one point there was way more. Like this yes. probably could have been a hour and a half. This was sermon. first draft was definitely 60 minutes. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, there was a lot more. Yeah. So I want to hone in there a little bit because one of the things you ended with was to say, hey, if we had more time, I would give you a picture of Jesus having an interaction with three different people um, that were in the midst of sexual sin yeah, um, and how he interacts with them. So do you want to unpack that a little bit as we start? Yeah, so uh, originally in my mind, I had seven passages I was mm. going to go to. And uh, as I began to work through it, I was like, I can't go to all seven of these passages. I'm going to have to narrow it down to the three that I chose. Yeah. So one of them was a teaching of Jesus. That was the fourth one. And uh, then the other three were all encounters that Jesus had the, with people who uh, had sexual sin either within their history or they were caught in the midst of sexual sin. So the first was the woman at the well in, uh, in John 4. And Jesus encounters a Samaritan woman and she's uh, coming to get water in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. And so immediately when you read that, you recognize that this woman has uh, a history that she's filled with shame or guilt for something because you usually didn't collect water at the midday because it's the hottest time of the day. You're going to use the most energy to get it. And you usually went in the cool of the morning or the cool of the night. And that's when you collected water. And that's when everybody else would. Yeah. So she encounters Jesus at a time when she would expect that nobody else would be there. And as Jesus talks with her, we actually find out about her history that uh, she's living with a guy. She's been married multiple times. And so this would be scandalous in her day. And I think even in our day uh, that you would have multiple marriages. I mean, how many celebrity uh, marriages, you know, oftentimes we refer to them as a joking way, right? Uh, I, I, I think one I remember when I was growing up had like five marriages, right? Mm. And they were a running joke on the evening talk shows. And so even today it's scandalous. So that's the first person. Second person is a woman that comes and Jesus is eating with a religious leader. And this woman comes in and she anoints Jesus' feet with oil and washes his feet with her hair. And this religious leader is just livid because he says, if Jesus knew who this woman was and her reputation, he would not allow her to touch him. Mm. One, it was scandalous for a woman to touch someone that wasn't her husband. Well, just for a woman to touch any male in public, 
with scandalous, to touch someone that isn't a family member or their husband, second scandalous, but apparently this woman had a history, um, a sexual history, that would say she should not be touching the feet of this rabbi. The third one is a woman who is actually dragged out in front of Jesus by a group of men, and, uh, and Jesus encounters her, and she has been caught in the act of adultery, is what we're told. And so the crowd wants Jesus to enact Old Testament judgment and actually stone her right there on the spot. Mm. There's no mention of the guy in that story. Mm. There's only the mention of the woman. And that this crowd would catch her in the act. Were they waiting in, in the closet for this or were they willing participants? And scholars have speculated lots of different things. So those are the three encounters that, right. that I think I wanted to touch on but just ran out of time. And I think they are so powerful because what we see with each one of the women that are encountered is that Jesus just accepts them, accepts them as they are. Jesus doesn't um, talk about the sexual history or the marital history of the woman with, that's at the well because he wants her to feel awful about herself. He's just saying, you know what, I know you and I accept you. And in fact, the woman goes running back to the village and says, come and meet the man who knows everything about me. And she is just so blown away by the hospitality of Jesus that somebody who, uh, who is a rabbi, clearly a rabbi, someone who is considered holy, would actually take time to talk with her. And Jesus is just so moved by that. He just completely accepts her. The woman who is washing his feet, again, Jesus knows her reputation. And he completely accepts her. And he elevates her above the religious leader, right? So he restores her to a position of honor mm. in that culture. And then the woman caught in adultery. You know, he just says, go and sin no more, right? And he says, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to stone you. And, uh, you know, everybody else is like waiting for him to do it. He says, let the first one that has no sin actually cast the first stone. And, and we know that's mm. Jesus. Yeah. Um, but he just redeems that situation and says, here, I'm giving you a new start, a fresh start. Go and live differently from that point on. And I just love the way that Jesus interacts with these three women. And what struck me incredibly about it is that here we have a patriarchy, right? Here we have the worst of patriarchy because you have men that are critical and abusive and dismissive of women. And Jesus, in the midst of a patriarchy that... Uh, abuses, um, uses, and dismisses women, women, Jesus actually steps up and accepts, redeems, restores, and honors women in this. And what caught me so much is that in a society that is patriarchal like that, I wonder what Jesus would do today in the patriarchy mm -hmm. today, which uses, abuses, and dismisses not just women, but also LGBTQ persons. And it makes me think that if Jesus were here today and he saw the patriarchy that exists in our world today, that he would accept, that he would redeem, that he would restore, and that he would honor those people. And he would call them to live in holiness. Yeah. I think there is something for us to learn in that. And that was part of what ended up on the cutting room floor, as yeah, it were, sure. was just this take on what's going on. Because Jesus is incredibly critical of the men in that day. He's incredibly critical of the patriarchy, the men that were in power and were abusive, dismissive, and using women or whoever. Jesus has something to say about that. Yeah. And so <clears throat> even along that line, like, um, and you give us a snapshot of this, in the midst of at least one of those stories, there is a call to holiness. There's yeah. this call to go and sin no more. And so for us today, as we seek to um, walk out, live out, practicing the ways of Jesus. Yeah. Um, I've had this conversation recently with students, with young adults, and over the years of this question of like, man, my Christian friend is not living out the way of Jesus, no. I think it should be. Um, specifically as it relates to um, a sexual biblical ethic. Um, what's, what's the place for, for us to challenge our 
friends, but also to love them. And yeah, what, yeah. How does what does that look like? Yeah, I would say I've uh, I've walked down both paths, right? Mm. Where one where it's like, oh, I just got to call out the sin mm. and challenge the the people in in my life and the people I love to actually live the way Jesus intends. I, I I've changed over the years, and I think the passage that probably changed me the most was John sixteen. John 16 is one of my favorite passages because it talks about Holy Spirit and what Holy Spirit does. It gives us three things Holy Spirit does in our lives. First is convict, a second is remind us of the words of Jesus, and the third is show us the hope that is found in Jesus. I take great comfort in that first one. It says the Holy Spirit's job that when he comes, he will convict the world of sin. And it reminds me of what my job is. Jesus says a little bit later on that we are just to love that actually he's, you know, this is part of the upper room discourse where Jesus is talking with his disciples on the night that he's betrayed in the upper room. And he says, I want people to know you by the quality and the character of your love for each other. And then he says, here's, here's the job of Holy Spirit, to convict. And so my job in the midst of that is to just love somebody unconditionally, to express the love of Jesus in the midst of that. It doesn't mean I'm going to dismiss anything that I see. You know, when we come to discipleship, there is a balance between love and truth. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times as evangelicals, which is what our stream of Christianity is, I know that's not a popular word, but that's <laughs> mm -hmm. the word that describes who we are. We're people yep. that want other people to follow Jesus. That's in essence what evangelicalism, all the other stuff you see in the news is nothing to do with it. But in our stream of evangelicalism, we tend to be much more about truth than about love. And actually, if we see Jesus as he walks, he is love and truth, the embodiment of both of those things. And so I need to come to this place where I'm going to put Jesus first in my life and I'm going to live the path of holiness. As people talk with me about the path of holiness or ask questions about things, and this is what I found, is that as I live and put Jesus first in everything, actually it sparks questions amongst the people that I love, the people that I'm in relationship. And Jesus actually opens the door through the power of Holy Spirit for me to have conversations where I can talk about the conviction that I have. Yeah. So for example, I was talking with someone recently um, who, you know, we disagree on something sexual, you know, uh, sexuality. And I said, well, for me, I'm putting, I've chosen to put Jesus first in everything. And so when it comes to this issue, I can't get past what Jesus says. And so I have to live this way. You have to decide for yourself if you're going to put Jesus first in everything. One of the key things to remember, I think, as we go through this is that we are all on a journey with Jesus. And on that journey, I often want you to be in the same place I am. But Jesus walks with you where you are and walks with me where I am. And so in terms of the Holy Spirit convicting and changing the hearts of people, he's going to be at work in your life, and I can't see that, right? And just as he's at, it, it, at work in my life, and you can't see that. And so by me loving you and being willing for the Spirit to use me at appropriate times, this is the way we walk with someone. And so love your friends, you know? Love them. Don't shy away from the truth, but you don't have to bash them over the head with the truth. Sure. Right? Yeah, totally. Because there are times when it's totally appropriate to actually begin to talk with someone about that. Yeah. But if you're con constantly harassing them or bashing them over the head with your truth, all you're doing is closing the door to future conversations. Yeah. That's so cool. that's kind of how I've shifted over the years from being someone who is very judgmental and, and figuring it was my job to convict the world of sin, I now realize it's not my job to convict the world of sin. It's my job to uh, love the yeah. world and be used by the Spirit as he sees fit. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Kirk. Um, I feel confident, based on conversations I've had since the sermon, um, of those who have heard it, that the Holy Spirit was at work mm. and and bringing some of that conviction and that weight of like, um, man, I have more. This invitation yeah. of more that, yeah. that Jesus is offering, this invitation of pointing to truth, pointing back to what Jesus is saying. And there's this stirring. And so for those people that are in that place that are like, man, I want to take what feels like first steps even towards a pursuit of holiness in yeah. our sexuality. What is... 
What is what does step one look like? Yeah, I think part of it is is bringing our sexuality out of the dark, mm. and uh, which is not easy. Yeah, you know, uh, I, w- I was in a discussion recently uh, with my wife Britton, and we were talking about our family of origin and whether or not we talked about sex or not. And uh, that was incredibly uncomfortable because my family, we didn't talk about that stuff, right? And she laughed and she goes, yeah, but you'll preach about it. Uh." (laughs) (laughs) Right? But some, you know, we have to bring our sexuality out of the darkness. And at least with trusted friends uh, and people that we know can, will honor us or respect us in the midst of that. So for someone who maybe has um, engaged in sex outside of marriage or even, uh, you know, taken in por- pornography, right? Or has a, a history with pornography. The first step is actually to bring that out into the light. You know, uh, Jesus says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him and with each other, yeah. right? And so we need to bring that into the light because nothing good glo- grows in the dark. Yeah. It's just a key principle. And, you know, uh, someone once said, you know, you're only as sick as the secrets you keep. Mm. And so when we keep something hidden, like maybe we had sex uh, with a former relationship or maybe we're having sex in a relationship right now that's not a marital relationship. If we keep that in the dark, we're just going to continue to do it. Yeah. Right? But if I actually come forward and I say, hey, Josh, here's what's going on within my life. You know what? That confession that I make to you actually begins to bring healing into my life. Yeah. Whether it is pornography or whether it is extramarital or premarital sex. When I begin to confess it, I begin to experience healing and it actually begins to stop and break the chain that's there. And so that's the first step. Bring it into the light. Begin to talk about it. If you even struggle with it, right, Um, just find someone you can trust. And it may be just the simplest little thing, right? Um, And just when my son and I were, when he was younger and growing up, you know, we had cable in the house and... Uh, at that time, I don't know if you remember this, Josh, or maybe you're too young for this, but uh, when there was cable and you actually had a wire plugged into your TV. But <laughs> Hey, you know, I know it existed, but I wasn't plugging in any wires back then. <laughs> well, on cable, you would get to about 10 o'clock at night, and all of a sudden everything would just, like the raunch factor just would go right up, right? Yeah. The stuff that they would never air at 8 o'clock all of a sudden was okay at 10 o'clock. Yeah. And uh, so my son and I, we would have some conversations from time to time. And I just said to him, you know what, son, uh, nothing good grows in the dark. So let's just go to bed. And I just found that was good for my heart, is that I just need to go to bed. And so there are things that we need to do. We bring it into the light with somebody that we trust. But then the second step is actually walking away or fleeing that sin-tempting environment. Yeah. Uh, There's a story in the Old Testament of a guy named Joseph, and Joseph uh, was sold as a slave in Egypt, and he was sold to a man named Potiphar, and Potiphar's wife was really attractive to Joseph, attracted to Joseph, not Joseph to her, but she was attracted to Joseph. And as a slave owner, I mean, Joseph is property, right, at this point, but Joseph didn't want to sin against God. And so even though you know what, this is something that he could have done and something that he could have been forced to do. He chose to say, I'm not going to sleep with Potiphar's wife. Yeah. And he chose to run instead of stay. Yeah. To the point where she grabs his cloak and he runs away. Now, I don't know if he was fully naked, but certainly he was disrobed in some way. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Because she's left hanging his clothes, hanging onto his clothes, and he's running away. Yeah. And I think we need to take the same approach when it comes to being in positions that could compromise our holiness when it comes to sexuality. We need to flee from there. Yeah. That may mean going home early from a date. That may mean, you know what, instead of sitting at home on a Saturday night with the browser open and whatever site you're at, that you call a friend and you go out. Yeah. It may, you know, it may mean a lot of different things yeah. for different people, but we have to come into the light with somebody we trust and then begin to come to this place where we flee from sin. Those are the starting steps, I think. That's great. What would you add to that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think have talked a lot around pornography in the context of teens and often that the trusted friend that comes to mind might actually not be that helpful in in that context of a high school student or even a junior high student. 
and that like mom or dad might be the most helpful resource in that yeah. and a hard conversation but like if you really want to flee and run this is like to invite parents into that right and I mean for young adults in this context of dating relationships like yeah. to invite parents in to say hey can you help set boundaries of what these things look like so yeah. that we it isn't getting to this place of a stumbling block it isn't getting to this place of um yeah, crossing a line, crossing a boundary that you both wanted to hold and maintain yep. because you want to practice the ways of Jesus. Yeah. Um, so I got one more question for okay. you. We, you kind of landed in this space to say the, the, the end goal of our, our faith, yeah. of our life, of our walk with Jesus is not our sexual fulfillment and it is not to get married and have kids. Like, and, and, that second one feels counter to what some of the conversation has been for like decades in the yeah. North American church, right? It has been this, look at, have a family, do this. This is where you want to be. Um, and that's not the heart of the gospel. That's yeah. not what Jesus communicates. It's not what Paul communicates. Um, and so you landed in this area to say, you know, for us to, to pray about, to discern, to think about what it looks like to, help others experience intimacy as Jesus envisions. Yeah. What would be, maybe first steps is the same language, but how do, we, how do we start there? How can we help others experience intimacy as Jesus envisions? That, that statement that I made about, uh, you know, the chief aim of, of humanity is not mm -hmm. sexuality or uh, procreation and mm -hmm. marriage. You know, I know that that probably, uh, people struggle with that yeah. because we have, that's not been the message that's been conveyed for so long. And really what we've done, where we've come to this place where we say actually family and marriage is most important, is we've taken something from Genesis 1 and we've twisted it and said made it the most important thing. Yeah. And uh, this was on the cutting room floor as well mm. for my sermon, is just Genesis 1 talks about uh, God creates us in his image and then he says, I want you to do two things. First is I want you to care for creation, right? I want you to, to have dominion over all things. The second thing is uh, go, go forth and multiply, yeah. right? And we've forgotten the care for all creation. We've done pretty good at the multiplying thing, yeah. right? Uh, but we forgot the other part. And I think that image of God, we also forgot that as well. Yeah. That actually we're created to be like the creator. And that's what Genesis 1 really is formulating because it's it has God taking chaos and creating order out of chaos. Yeah. And then he creates humanity in his image and says, I want you to continue to create order out of chaos. And I want you to multiply just like I've multiplied with you, right? And so there's this aspect of this. This is where I come from when I, when I say our chief end is not sexuality, procreation, or marriage. It's actually to be like God. Yeah. And uh, so that's where I come from with that. So how do, what does that look like, yeah. you know, for us today? Um, I think Jesus gives us a new way of thinking about multiplication that applies both to, uh, or procreation as it were, having, having, growing a family and having a family. I think Jesus gives us a new model that applies both to the married person, to the single person, mm -hmm. uh, to the cisgender, heterosexual, or the LGBTQ person. Yeah. And that is, Jesus says at the end of Matthew, in Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations. Yeah. Right? There is the new way that we multiply. Yeah. And so for us, I think we need to say, our chief aim is to be like Jesus. What is, what is Jesus? how is Jesus like, right? He pursues holiness in every part of his life and he makes disciples. Yeah. And, you know, that is where we need to really begin to sit and to live is to say, okay, how am I reproducing myself as a disciple of Christ? Yeah. And how am I helping somebody engage in holiness? So I think there's space for us to look beyond our family. Yeah. And to begin to say, hey, you know what, what is it, there's a single person that I work with or there's a single person in my life. What if I began to invite them for Christmas and birthdays, right? Because one of the deep needs that we all have is this connectionness, right? 
and for you and me as as married men, we got a wife and we got kids, mm -hmm. right? And uh, but so for someone who's single, do they have that same sort of connectedness? They may or they may not. Right. So I think there's a space for us to uh, open our families because Jesus said, you know, who are my mother and my brothers and my sister? It's anyone who follows God. Yeah. So we, I think we need to expand our boundaries of what family looks like. I also think we need to begin to look around at uh, LGBTQ teens um, because the suicidality, yeah. self-harm yeah. is exponentially greater. And we need to begin to say, we, we should not as Christians sit and just allow that. Yeah. And the way we just need to love and care and accept and trust that Jesus through this power of the Spirit is gonna convict where there needs to be convict conviction that he's gonna lead, he's gonna show them the future that's found with them, and we need to be people who actually help others encounter Jesus. Yeah. I don't know if that's first steps or that's still too sure. high a level in that, but I think it, we need to look at our friendships, and we need to look at our family relationships, and we need to invite people into our family and to our friendships and craft a family like Jesus did. Yeah. That was made up of, yeah, his mother Mary, <laughs> eventually his brothers, right? Um, but also 12 guys yeah. and another 72 on top of that. And, you know, his family was huge. Yeah. And I think we need to follow Jesus in the steps of rethinking what family looks like. Yeah. Yeah. I think our, our familiar, our comfortable with family, with our friendships is those that look like us and yeah. act like us and live similar lives to us, right? And yeah. it, it does take a mind shift to break out of that and, and invite people into authentic relationship that are not the same as us. As Christians, we should be the ones that are first to do it yeah. because we are adopted children, Yeah. right? Every single one of us, a follower of Jesus, we've been adopted, Ephesians 1, we've been adopted into the family of God. Yeah. So we should be adopting other people into our family. Amen. Yeah. That's great. That's a great place to end. Yeah. Thanks yeah. so much, Kirk. You bet. Thanks. Thanks for joining us on Deep Dive until next week. And I think actually next week the tables are turned because you're preaching. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and I'm going to do the asking. <laughs> yeah. So come back next week when Josh and I are back here talking about sin. Yeah. <laughs> What's the subtitle? What's the big deal, isn't it, or something like that? What's the problem? What is it? Yeah, yeah what, what is it? Yeah. yeah, what is it? What's the problem? So we're going to talk about sin. I hope you'll join us then. Take care. See ya.